if I can, I call this meeting of the Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee of the House Foreign Affairs Committee to order. Uh, today's hearing is about a part of the world and a people that most Americans know nothing about, Baluchistan, an area inhabited by the Baluch people uh, who trace their history uh, back for centuries. Uh, Baluchistan deserves our attention because it is a turbulent land marked by human rights violations committed by regimes that are hostile to, the Ameri to America's interests and values. It holds a very strategic location in an area of intense international rivalries. Baluchistan comprises about uh, 800 miles of coast at the head of the Arabian Sea between Iran and India and runs inland uh, to southern Afghanistan. The Baluchs are a fiercely independent warrior people who have made their land a perilous land to invade, uh, uh, except until the natural gas and other mineral wealth was discovered there in this last century. During the 17th century, the tribes were united in a loose confederation until British, uh, the British incorporated the area into the Indian Empire in the 19th century. The British, however, <clears throat> ruled the area with a light touch, leaving tribal chiefs uh, in control of their everyday affairs. Uh, at the time uh, of the partition of the British Raj into contemporary Pakistan and India back in 1947, the Baluch leaders voiced a desire for independence. <clears throat> but, the Pakistan, but the Pakistan army took control of the area and forced the Baluch tribal chiefs to submit to the rule from Islamabad. Uh, the partition was based on religion, that partition between India uh, and Pakistan. It was uh, based on religion rather than ethnic identity. The Baluchs are Sunni Muslims, and Pakistan, which was founded as an Islamic state, sees itself as the rightful ruler of all Muslims of the subcontinent. Pakistani ideology holds Islam uh, as the first identity, but other people identify themselves and their interest in many different ways. Uh, in practice, Pakistan does not treat all Muslims equally. The Baluch uh, have, been, uh, have seen little benefit from the development of the natural gas, coal, gold, uranium, and copper that is produced in their province. Instead, the wealth is taken for the benefit of the dominant Punjabi elite that runs the country from Islamabad. Baluchistan remains the poorest province in Pakistan, even though it is the richest in natural resources. Attacks against natural gas installations and pipelines by uh, Baluch insurgents uh, are steadily increasing, and there have been assassinations of Chinese engineers who are helping Pakistan uh, develop resources that will be shipped out of the province to benefit Islamabad and, of course, Beijing. The province's major port, uh, uh, let me pronounce it, Gwandar, Gwadar, Gwadar, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Gwadar, see, we're going to learn by this. This is going to be here where we're going to learn about things. <laughs> and uh, the port of Gwadar uh, has also been developed with the help of China and may become a naval base as well as a trade and energy transit center. Pakistan, however, is using this development to attract uh, Punjabis into the province with the aim, perhaps, of outnumbering the local native Baluch. Uh, there was a major uprising in Baluchistan uh, that ran from 1973 to 77, and the Baluch nationalists were inspired by the independence of Bangladesh uh, which was won in 1971. The Baluch insurgency, however, uh, was ruthlessly crushed by Pakistani forces. After two decades of relative calm, uh, insurgency broke out again in 2005. Islamabad has refused to concede any legitimacy to Baluch nationalism or to engage the Baluch leadership in, ser uh, in serious negotiations. Um, its response has been based on brute force, including extrajudicial killings. The State Department and Amnesty International have condemned Pakistan for these murderous acts in Baluchistan. Across the border in Iran, 
there is a province, Sistan, Baluchistan, uh, which is dominated by the uh, ethnic Baluchs. Uh, the Mullah regime there has denied them their basic human rights, and as in Pakistan, the Baluchs are denied proper education and economic opportunities. As in Pakistan, the resources of the Sistan Baluchistan are often used to support an elite in a distant capital, uh, leaving the local Baluchs in both countries uh, impoverished. Uh, the, the governor of Sistan Baluchistan is appointed by the Mullah regime in Tehran. The governor of Pakistan's Baluchistan in, uh, is determined by a very complicated process which has some democratic elements, but the nationalist parties uh, thought, thought the system was so corrupt that they boycotted the elections in 2008. I hope our witnesses can shed some light on how free and fair a political process in that area could be and, and uh, give us some insights into what's going on there in terms of the political process. A low-level insurgency is in progress in Iran as it is in Pakistan, with both countries reacting with the same brutal uh, way of stamping out resistance. The Baluch in Iran are, are even more oppressed than those in Pakistan because Tehran is run by Shi'i theocrats who consider Sunni Muslims to be worse than heretics. Uh, Sunni uh, Baluch clerics have been killed as part of an Iranian counterinsurgency campaign. Uh, South Asia cannot be understood purely in religious terms as Muslim versus Muslim or Sunni versus Shi'i. Uh, group identities there are rooted in deeper tribal and village allegiances with cultural attributes and historical experiences that go back for centuries. Uh, this hearing will explore what these mean uh, to the, uh, and what they mean to the United States, what are the geopolitics uh, of the region, uh, the security of Pakistan, Iran, and their neighbors, how do these things are being affected, as well as uh, the stability of that whole area. Uh, also, we're, uh, we're looking at to find out about those things and uh, how all of these factors and the dynamics that are at work uh, play into the existing uh, uh, borders and aspirations of self-determination uh, from all the perspectives that Americans hold uh, in value. We believe in self-determination and democracy, believe that people have a right to speak up, and but we are also very concerned about the stability and uh, of, of that air part of the world and what this means to uh, America and to the people there. So as I say, this hearing, although I know that a lot of people uh, saw this with trepidations, we're trying to understand something that uh, uh, we, uh, and I think we as the American people, have not paid attention to. So we need to learn things like how to pronounce uh, the port there and things like that. But even more than that, how to identify what forces are at work and who's legitimate, has some legitimate complaints, and what would be uh, what America should be doing in reaction uh, to the events there with the people there. So we're not here to uh, we're here to learn, and that's what this hearing's all about. And with that, I would turn to my ranking member, uh, Mr. Carnahan, for his opening remarks. Uh, let me uh, <laughs> let, let me note. Uh, it, uh, please don't applaud. Please don't throw fruit at me either. Okay, so uh, <laughs> uh, uh, it'd be nice uh, just uh, because it takes up time, and we got to be out of here in about an hour. So go right ahead, Mr. Chairman. I'm, I'm glad to see you have a uh, you know a rousing ovation here today in this uh, subcommittee hearing. Uh, you, you say that like someone who's used to being applauded and having thro uh, fruit thrown at you. So, oh yes, <laughs> it, it goes along with the territory. But uh, seriously. Uh, thank you for uh, holding this hearing today. Uh, it's really very critical that we examine U.S. relations with Pakistan in mul multiple contexts like this. Uh, Mr. Chairman, since you last called a hearing this past summer on U.S. strategy in South Asia, it's fair to say that the U.S.-Pakistan relationship has continued to strain but remains absolutely a critical partnership. I would urge the Pakistani government to step, it, step up its efforts to weed out terror activity within and along its own borders. Pakistan has significant challenges within its own country that have national, regional, and certainly international implications. 
One of the concerns in the topic of today's hearing is the situation in Baluchistan. This past month, the State Depart a State Department spokesman said, quote, the U.S. is deeply concerned about the ongoing violence in Baluchistan, especially targeted killings, disappearances, and other human rights abuses, unquote. She further stated that the administration takes allegations of human rights abuses very seriously and that it had discussed these issues with Pakistani officials. While the administration is not here today to testify, I would urge U.S. officials to continue to bring these issues up in the course of our diplomatic discussions. With the significant investment of U.S. funding in Pakistan, it is Congress's job to make sure we're getting the return on the investment that our taxpayers deserve. We need to ensure that every dollar of U.S. taxpayer-funded assistance is being used properly and in our interest. Vigorous oversight of all U.S. foreign aid is critical to the success of our programs there and is a key component to building infrastructure and capacity in Pakistan. However, the U.S. and international commitment to Pakistan is not enough. In the face of all its challenges, it is critical that Pakistan worked to ensure the integrity of its own people and its own country, including Baluchistan. And as the U.S., the U.N., and NATO continue in Afghanistan, the afghan baluchistan border remains critical to ensuring that we are making decisions that move Pakistan, Afghanistan, and the entire region toward increased stability. Again, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I look forward to hearing the uh, esteemed panel of witnesses that we have with us today. Thank you, Mr. Sherman, do you have an opening statement? I do indeed. Go right ahead. I want to thank the chairman of this subcommittee for allowing me to uh, make a statement at this hearing. Uh, I've been on the full committee for 15 years and uh, haven't had the honor to uh, be a member of this subcommittee, but uh, have, a have had a chance to see uh, its work when reported to the full committee. My statement will uh, focus uh, not only on uh, Baluchistan, but the adjoining area of the Sindh province. Uh, many Baluch live in the Sindh province, and to, uh, to a great extent, the Pakistani government treatment of both these southern areas uh, is similar. Uh, Pakistan-U.S. relations hit an all-time low last year uh, when we found bin Laden in uh, Badabad and uh, perhaps later when allegedly uh, uh, the uh, U.S. Embassy in Kabul was uh, attacked uh, by um, those who may have had the uh, help of the ISI. Uh, that is why it's more important than ever for the U.S. to reach out to the various people uh, who have been marginalized by the Pakistani government. The people of Balochistan and Sindh, their culture, language, and way of life are under attack and underrepresented uh, from so many major government entities in Pakistan. Political activities defending Baluch and Sindhi rights are subject to arrests, disappearances, torture, and even killing. I believe the U.S. must reach out to these underrepresented historic segments of the Pakistani population. The Baluch uh, people are culturally and traditionally uh, regarded as secular and moderate, uh, strongly influenced by the cultural traditions of uh, Sufism, both uh, the Sindhis and the, uh, and the Baluch. Um, have a, a culture that I think uh, uh, will uh, be consistent with American values. Uh, and uh, a, uh, a significant part of the people of Sindh, of course, uh, have are Baluch ethnically or have uh, Baluch origins. The Baluch and Sindhis, uh, uh, including those Baluch living in Sindhi uh, province, share the goal of uh, government recognition of their cultural, political, and economic rights. Baluchistan is Pakistan's most underdeveloped prom, uh, province. It has the highest unemployment and poverty rates, the lowest quality of life when measured economically of any province in Pakistan. The road infrastructure is also poor. And as the chairman points out, this is ironic because it is uh, uh, such a resource-rich area, uh, especially as to natural gas. Um, the Islam Islamabad's reluctance to give the Baluch people more autonomy is uh, in part uh, because they covered those resources. The Baluch seek a more uh, equitable uh, uh, share of the region's uh, rich uh, natural resources, and that is a, another uh, a, a source of resentment. 
A third source of resentment is the Pakistani army uh, cantonments uh, that are uh, being established in the Baluch areas. A small minority of Baluch have undertaken the armed struggle, which was described uh, by the chairman, and uh, he also described its history. Uh, there is also, uh, as the chairman described, uh, Baluch on the Iranian side of the border uh, waging uh, a conflict against the Ayatollah regime. Uh, in this critical part of the world, we cannot uh, afford to ignore the southern half of Pakistan, especially uh, uh, its population of Baluch and Sindhis. Um, I, uh, I had an opportunity last year to found the Sindh Caucus, and I'd in invite uh, my colleagues to join. Uh, it is co-chaired by Dan Burton. Uh, Adam Schiff is an active member. Um, and uh, strong, you know, as I've noted, uh, the people of Sindh uh, uh, have a, uh, a, a moderate tradition that is consistent uh, with U.S. values and U.S. interests. Um, for many years, the Pakistani government has uh, tried to impose just one language, Urdu, on the people of Pakistan, when in fact Sindhi is spoken by more people than Urdu. Uh, we need to reach out to the people of Sindh province and others who speak the Sindhi language, and we need to do so in the Sindh language. Right now, the Voice of America is broadcasting only in Urdu. Um, that is why I want to commend our, our full committee for voting for my amendment to uh, require that the Voice of America start uh, broadcasting in the Sindh language, and uh, now it's a matter of actually making that happen through the bureaucracy and uh, through the Appropriations Committee. Um, and I look forward to the day when that is a success and we're back here talking about the Baluch language. Um, I believe my time has expired and I yield back to the chair. Thank you very much. <clears throat> it's always great to chair a hearing where someone is uh, more radical than I am on certain issues. <laughs> <laughs> a rare occurrence, actually, I might actually, actually, we see eye to eye on almost everything, except that he's a Democrat and I'm a Republican. <laughs> <laughs> we also have a, another soft-spoken member of Congress joining us, uh, Louis uh, Gomert from Texas, and um, with a uh, ask unanimous consent that he may sit in on this hearing as uh, and have the rights of uh, of all the other members of the committee. So, so ordered. And uh, we have a great, Louis, do you have a couple minute opening statement for us or go right ahead if you had to take two minutes. I'll, I'll wait. Take one minute. Take one minute and get yourself. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It is uh, an honor to be here. And it's, it's uh, I think, just wonderful that you've called this hearing. And I appreciate uh, the interest I'm hearing from our Democratic friends. But when you have a place in the world uh, that was forced to be part of another country in 1948, as Baluchistan was, and then in, in that same country, uh, the people that are native to that area are harassed, what some of us would consider to have uh, be the human rights of dignity that every human being should be afforded, are violated on a regular basis by the national government. Uh, and then further, that government goes on to, whether it's official or unofficial, to furnish uh, supplies, encouragement. What uh, people I met with in, in uh, forward operating bases in Afghanistan last month tell me are the supplies, the, the, uh, the IEDs, the weapons uh, coming into the Taliban, so many are coming from Pakistan and coming from the Baluchistan area. And uh, as, as an editorial I was pleased to read in the Pakistan Daily Times noted, maybe it's time that we quit working so hard to support the Taliban in another country and concentrate more on our own country. And I think it would make the United States very happy to see that. It would make people of Afghanistan very happy that the Taliban was no longer being provided uh, weapons 
to inflict harm on them, and it would make the Balochs very happy from my discussion with them that uh, they were allowed to live in peace uh, without being subjected to horrors from their own government. So I'm delighted you asked for this hearing, and I appreciate the opportunity to, to be here. All right. Thank you very much. No, 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 no applause. No. <laughs> uh, the, uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Gomert. We have uh, witnesses ahead of us. You'll, uh, you'll note that the, uh, there are a couple more witnesses than we originally planned. Uh, because I, uh, we do know so little about this region, we didn't know who to invite. Uh, and there were some suggestions that were sent to me over the internet uh, that we maybe should expand it uh, to make sure there's a more, little bit more represent, representative of a cross-section of views, and that's what we did. So uh, uh, that's, uh, I want to thank whoever sent me those suggestions, uh, and I think we're going to have a much richer hearing because of it. But we have a time problem, and the time problem is that they're going to call votes sometime in the next hour maybe even half hour, 45 minutes. So I'm going to hold each one of you to the five-minute rule for your testimony. And I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to because we, otherwise there won't be any time for questions and answers at all. Uh, we have with us on the panel uh, Christine Fair, Assistant Professor, Center for Peace and Security Studies at the Edmund Walsh School of Foreign Service in Georgetown University. Previously, she has served as a senior political scientist with RAND Corporation, a political officer to uh, the United Nations Assistance Mission to Afghanistan, and uh, as a member of the International Institute for Strategic Studies, the Council on Foreign Relations, and serves on the editorial uh, board of studies uh, in conflict and terrorism. To what I will uh, uh, introduce each one just prior to their testimony, and we know how soft-spoken you are, Dr. Fair and how you never cause any controversy, but you enlighten everyone. So <laughs> you may uh, proceed. Five minutes. Sir, you're one of my favorite Republicans. <laughs> we don't see eye to eye on a lot of things, but on the things we see eye to eye on, we see eye to eye. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak on this really important topic. Um, as you noted, uh, there aren't that many folks that know about Baluchistan. There aren't that many folks that know about Pakistan. And when this topic comes up, it's usually focused on the war on terror in Afghanistan. So it's nice to see that there's a hearing specifically dedicated to this particular issue. I've submitted um, a longer, very long written statement that I request become part of the permanent record. Uh, in that statement, I spend quite a bit of time trying to map out what we know geographically, historically, and demographically about Baluchistan. Unfortunately, we don't know a lot because the Pakistan census is terribly out of date. And unfortunately, the process of a census in Pakistan has become very politicized. But what we do know is that the, the Baluch ethnic group is the largest ethnic group in the province. Uh, the exact numbers are perhaps unknown. But we also know that by any measure of human development, and I put a few, just a sample in my testimony, by any measure of human development, by any, development, uh, any measure of economic development, Baluchistan always ranks all uh, below the other provinces in Pakistan, um, with the perhaps exception of Fatah. Um, in addition to that, as you note uh, in your opening statement, Baluchistan is actually a very large producer of resources. Yet, ironically, even though Baluchistan produces about 40 percent of the country's gas, very few Baluch actually take advantage of that gas because there's no infrastructure for them to do so. So when you meet with folks from Baluchistan, they'll tell you the only time they get gas or electricity hookups is when a cantonment comes to town. The Army will counter that it's very hard to spread that infrastructure throughout a province, which accounts for about 5 percent of Pakistan's pop uh, population, but about 40 percent of the terrain. So they'll know that there are lo logistical challenges. Obviously, the truth lies somewhere in between. But Baluchistan's appalling human rights record also stands before us. We have Human Rights Watch here. We have Amnesty International. Everyone knows about the forced abductions that are going on. Everyone knows that uh, Baluchistan has been a very restive province from day one. Many Baluch didn't even want to join the Union of Pakistan. In that sense, it shares a lot of similarities to Kashmir, right? Kashmir was also forcibly annexed. And many of the challenges that we see happening in Pakistan vis-a-vis -vis Baluchistan could also, I think, be said in some measure um, about the situation in Kashmir. Curiously, what I find very puzzling about Pakistan is that over the last well, since 2004, the state's been waging a pretty vicious counterinsurgency campaign against elements of the so-called Pakistan Taliban, and it's generated quite a bit of outrage amongst Pakistanis. Yet the last six decades 
of episodic military use of force against Baluch insurgents doesn't really cause that kind of outrage at all. In fact, in my written statement, I provided a link to a very fascinating BBC documentary that was called Con Baluchistan Kojantahe, who knows Baluchistan? They went around Lahore and they asked folks, do you know what Baluchistan is? Can you name a city? And it was actually appalling how few people knew where the province was, that there was an insurgency, that people couldn't even name the major city of Quetta. So you have this very interesting combination of the ability of lethal force, but yet you have very few people in Pakistan who know about it. A second related problem is that because it has so few people and because the representation in the National Assembly is based upon population, it means that Baluchistan can never have any heft in the National Assembly. While it has equal representation in the Senate, um, as I'm sure you know, in Pakistan the Senate has, has very little power. Now, while, while we focus upon the abductions and the state-sponsored human rights abuses, which are numerous, I do want to point out, though, that this isn't the only kind of violence which is happening in Pakistan or in, in Baluchistan. So the forced disappearances, I'm sure, my colleagues from Amnesty and from Human Rights Watch will, will dilate upon them. But there are also targeted killings that are unfortunately done by some Baluch. I understand the sentiment that there is this perception that they're being colonized by the Punjab, but unfortunately there is a path dependency problem. Baluchistan has a massive problem with education, right? So how do you produce teachers from a province that doesn't have, on the main, people who are adequately educated to produce the folks who can subsequently become teachers? So there is a need for teachers to come from other provinces in Baluchistan, but I'm sure Human Rights Watch, and I've written an entire report about this, many of those teachers have been singled out because they're Punjabi. And it's not just teachers, it's also providers of other human services, police in particular, are very vulnerable. So I, I only don't only want to draw attention to the targeted killing of one community by state forces, but in fact we have a lot of axes <coughs> of violence that are converging in Baluchistan. Another one that doesn't get a lot of attention is also the sectarian violence. Shia have paid a heavy price in, in Pakistan, and we can continue to see this kind of violence happening in Baluchistan. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate this opportunity, and I'm sure you will agree with me, as will um, Congressman Carnahan, that such an important problem cannot be approached in a partisan manner. And we have to act as Americans with our American values and bring those to bear, not an ideology of any kind. Let us start with the incontrovertible fact, and that is that Baluchistan is occupied territory. It never willingly acceded to Pakistan, does not now wish to be part of Pakistan. If a plebiscite or referendum were held tomorrow, it would vote to leave Pakistan, as would every province and territory west of the Indus River. We have a fundamental problem in that we refuse to see Pakistan for what it is. We imagine or pretend that it's a legitimate state, really in our own image, a democracy, but it's a democracy only as long as its military rulers allow it to be a democracy. It is, in fact, a miniature empire, a last artifact, along with a few other countries around the world, of the imperial age, with artificial borders 
which we defend as we do elsewhere. And I find it a travesty that our State Department obsesses on the inviolability of borders around the world drawn at Versailles or in Berlin in the 1880s or in the late 1940s. How is it in the year of our Lord 2012, we send our troops to bleed or die to defend the residue of the European world order? And let me be clear, I do not argue that we should actively campaign militarily to change every border in the world. I argue that when the train is coming down the tracks toward you, you are wise to step off the tracks. In the last two decades, since the end of the Cold War, the United States of America, the greatest force for freedom in human history, every war and conflict in which we have engaged has been triggered by or exacerbated by these flawed European borders. How can we send our soldiers and Marines and Navy corpsmen to die for that? That's not who we are. But what is Pakistan? Pakistan is bisected by the Indus River. To the east of the Indus River is metropolitan, core Pakistan, the Punjab, and to a great extent, the province of Sindh. It is the world of the subcontinent. It is a different civilization from that west of the Indus River. West of the Indus River in the occupied territories, you have the culture of Central and Mid-Asia. When you cross the Indus River either way, even the food is different. And we look at this occupied territory of Balochistan specifically, where people who simply yearn for fundamental freedoms, for the right to determine their own future, whether or not they have a battery of qualified teachers ready to go. We must admire their determination to sacrifice everything against enormous odds in Pakistan and Iran for the simple right to say, I am a Baluch. I will decide my own future. Instead, we face, we support Pakistan, their oppressor, their oppressor, a state that actively supports and arms terrorists and insurgent movements in Afghanistan that kill and maim our own soldiers. The Pakistani government is not our friend. It is not the friend of the Baluch or the other subjugated peoples west of the Indus River. The Durand Line, of course, which divides Pakistan and, our, and Afghanistan, is artificial. It divides people who want to be together. Mr. Chairman, my time is running out, so let me simply say this last thing. 200 years ago, one of our greatest presidents faced a problem. The Barbary pirates refused to let our ships pass in peace, so we paid tribute money to let our goods pass. Thomas Jefferson put a stop to that. Today, we are paying tribute money again, this time to the Pakistani pirates, to let our goods pass to Afghanistan. Mr. Chairman, I am looking for a Thomas Jefferson. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I'm looking for William Eaton myself. <laughs> it's pretty deep there. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I'm trying to be bipartisan. All right. Uh, thank you very much, and with the office, I'm very, uh, and, and I appreciate you softening your remarks and making them so nobody really knows where you're coming from. <laughs> Great. The, both of our witnesses have been very tough, and that's what we want to be. We want to be up front, because if people are hiding what their real beliefs are, trying to couch it, we're never going to, people aren't going to understand what the reality is uh, if we're trying to, to not make other people angry, but we want to make sure all of us are educated to that. Our next witness is uh, uh, Mr. T. Kumar. Oh, there you are. I was looking at this. Mr. T. Kumar, who I know very well, an advocacy director for Asia Pacific for Amnesty International, who is a persona here on the Hill and uh, uh, a champion of, of human rights. He has worked in several Asian and African countries and served as a human rights minority, or monitor, excuse me, in many Asian countries, as well as Bosnia, Haiti, Guatemala, South Africa. Uh, Kumar is frequently uh, lecturing uh, Foreign Service Institute where U.S. diplomats are trained and often testifies before the United States Senate and House of Representatives. He holds an advanced degree in law from the University of Pennsylvania Law School 
and you may proceed. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Mr. Chairman and members of Congress, when I saw the announcement about uh, having a hearing on Balochistan, it came back to Afghanistan during the time when Afghanistan was forgotten by the entire world. Chairman, you understand what happened after the collapse of Soviet Union. The people of Balochistan was going through nightmare for the years. Torture, disappearances, extrajudicial executions. But world refused to look at them. Leave alone Pakistani. Even the Pakistani civil society was limited. There were some exceptions. Did not speak up about the plight of Baluchis that they were undergoing. <coughs> Massive disappearances. Disappearance means to kidnap people or arrest people and never be heard ag again. Hundreds disappeared. We have documented recently, we are talking about after the so-called democracy came to Pakistan, almost 250 disappearances in a year's time. So the, and extrajudicial executions, torture. So the brutality was continuing in Balochistan, despite the fact that it is just next door to Afghanistan where U.S. had enormous interest and Pakistan, again, enormous interest. So on that note, we are pleased and honored that you are holding this hearing to bring attention to the plight of uh, Baluchis there. What's happening to Baluch people? It's a kill and dump operation. It's a terror mechanism that the Pakistani military and the intelligence officers who used to terrorize the local population. It may be for a political reason, because some people, maybe a majority of Baluch, may be asking for independence. By the way, on that note, Amnesty International, as a human rights organization, does not take position on whether a, whether a country is independent or not. But having said that, they brutalized the population because the population wanted some opening in their political aspirations. Then when people speak up, the weapons that were used against them were unfortunately manufactured in the U.S. and given to by the U.S. A couple of years ago, when the disappearance was high-rocketing in Balochistan, the Balochistan governor was here. So I asked him, actually at USIP, uh, I asked him whether, whose weapons are you using? He said, oh, it's American weapons. The reason is, no conditions were put on us. So it's a matter of principle that Congress can put some requirement that no U.S. weapon should be used in Balochistan in abusing its own citizens. <coughs> that is something you can do. You don't get permission from the State Department. Speaking about State Department, they were in sleep for years, not only now, earlier on as well. When Senator Baluch, Senator Baluch, uh, Sana Baluch was invited again to USIP, they refused to give him visa to come and testify. He's a senator, elected senator. So there are concerns that even U.S. over the years have ignored for different political reasons. So now the time has come through this hearing and through other mechanisms. We hope the state will also, the administration will also change its policy. Not about any political questions there, but primarily talking about the plight of Balochis and how to stop abuses that are happening against them. There are also other people who are involved in abusing the human rights in that area. One group is obviously the group that uh, fight for independence. These are Baluch nationalists. They were the prime victims of abuse. At the same time, there are reports that they also targeted killing of Punjabis and others. So it's a time that Baluch population examined themselves. That if you, since you have been abused, you know the value of human rights. You should speak up and to stop the abuses against anyone. It could be anyone. I know it's time. Your time's out. Thank, Thank you very much. That, that was left on a good note. But no, 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 don't, don't applaud because challenging people who want to have their human rights respected, challenging them to respect the human rights of others is a really important point, and you just made that. We have two other witnesses, and then we will go into our questions and answers. 
Uh, but we are joined in the meantime uh, by another member of Congress, a, a champion of uh, American uh, commitment to freedom and democracy, a, a real patriot from Texas, uh, and a man of the law, Judge Poe. In fact, both Congressman Gohmert and Judge Poe are both former judges, and so when we talk about the law and, you, and the violations of human rights, uh, they shine out with their expertise as well as their passion. So we're very happy to have you join us, Your Honor. And we'll proceed with the witnesses right now so we can get through this and then go on to questions and answers. Uh, we have Dr. Hussein Bohr, a lawyer active in facilitating trade, investment, and project development between American corporations and their counterparts from Gulf countries. Dr. Bohr previously served as an adjunct professor of law at the Catholic University uh, of America and was the energy and economic advisor uh, to the Embassy of Qatar in Washington, D.C. from uh, 1982 to uh, 1998. He has written extensively on various issues relating to the Middle East, including treaties on Iran and nationalities. He holds a Ph.D. in degrees from both American University and Washington University, and uh, you may proceed, Dr. Bohr. Thank you. I'm, of course, uh, an American Baluch myself, and uh, thank you for the opportunity, uh, honorable members. As you know, uh, Baluchistan uh, is uh, the most, uh, really, the Baluch people are the most persecuted, oppressed, and neglected people in the Middle East and so South Asia. And of course, uh, you, Mr. Chairman, uh, gave very good uh, overview of Baluch history. The only thing I can add, Baluch, uh, look at their history uh, in uh, one term. Baluch era or Baluch Dora, I mean the era when the Baluch uh, ruled themselves and their institutions and values were su supreme in Baluchistan and the post Baluch era, which is the era of colonialism, and of course their subsequent uh, uh, division and in forceful incorporation into Iran and Afghanistan, and, pa and uh, of course Pakistan. And of course before the advent of colonialism, of, you, you should also notice that the Baluch were independent, like Europe, there were several uh, feudal states, and in many eras also in the 14th, 15th century, you had a large confederacy, of uh, uh, Baluchi state uh, and their reigns extending from Kerman in the east in Persia to the Indus Valley. And that is uh, also the current boundaries of Baluchistan as a whole. And of course, as you well know, the uh, Baluchistan was divided uh, by the British into three parts, uh, Goldsmith Line drawn in 1871 by the British uh, colonial officers uh, uh, divided Baluchistan between Iran and uh, British India, and of course uh, uh, the Doran line uh, drawn also by the British in 1894 uh, divided uh, Baluchistan between uh, uh, British India and uh, Afghanistan. And of course, uh, but Baluch uh, ever since uh, uh, they have been struggling to regain their lost freedom to reassert the Baluch control over their homeland, Baluchistan, and to preserve their language and culture. Huh? And the Baluch have never accepted or recognized uh, either the Goldsmith line dividing the Baluch between Iran and Pakistan, uh, nor the Doran line separating northern Baluchistan. Huh? Uh, this is reflected in four insurrection by the Baluch against Pakistan in 1948, 1958, 1973, and 2005 insurgency, which is continuing and growing in strength each day. Like Baluch, Afghanistan and nationalist Pashtuns Pakistan also do not recognize the Duran line. Of course, my colleagues, uh, uh, they well articulated the plight of uh, human rights uh, in Baluchistan huh? and the egregious violation of uh, Baluch human rights by Pakistani army and the Pakistani government. Huh? The only thing I can add, according to a report published by the Asian Human Rights uh, um, Commission on January uh, 31st last month, uh, uh, 
uh, it uh, says that the extrajudicial killings of this appeared person in Baluchistan include 23 uh, bullet riddle bodies found during the first month of this year, m during January. Uh, 56 mul mutilated bodies during the last six months. And 271 bodies since July 2010. That tells you about the extent of the brutality. And according, of course, uh, to Belush sources, the figures are much higher. And uh, since 2001, about 4,000 Belush have been, uh, have disappeared. And uh, uh, this is a continuing problem. And that is one of the main reasons that the Belush yeah, Excuse me, you said from 2001 till the present date, how for many more than 4,000. 4,000? Yes, sir. People have disappeared. And uh, and of course, this is one of the main uh, impediment to Baluch leaders negotiating with the weak civilian government in Pakistan uh, until these issues are resolved to the satisfaction of the aggrieved Baluch families. Uh, no Baluch leader would dare to uh, negotiate with the Pakistani government. And of course, they also, uh, uh, as they stated, uh, Baluchistan is uh, one of the most richest uh, land in the world oil, uh, uh, aluminum, gold, coal, but it is uh, exploited for the benefit of uh, non baluch in Punjab. And uh, 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 even though the Baluchistan account for 30% of the natural gas exploited in Pakistan, Baluchistan share is only 17%. The rest, uh, even the British colonialists were not so uh, greedy and brutal. And that's why that the uh, Baluchistan uh, remained the most, uh, the least developed uh, region in Pakistan. And uh, uh, there is no uh, really basic industries to talk about. Huh? And of course, uh, uh, that is one of the main reasons for the ongoing insurgency okay. in Baluchistan. Um, huh? That's the end of your five minutes right now, so we'll have to move on uh, during the questions and answers. And uh, all of, by the way, uh, all of, uh, with unanimous consent, uh, the entire, uh, uh, your entire statements will be uh, uh, put into the record. So when you get a record of the hearing, your entire statement will be in the record. We now turn to uh, Ali Dayan Hassan, is, a, is the uh, Pakistan Director of Asia Division of Human Rights Watch. Before taking over as Pakistan Director, he served as Human Rights Watch for South Asia as a researcher, and uh, that, that he did since uh, 2003, and specialized uh, uh, in Pakistan. Before joining the Human Rights Watch, Hassan was a senior editor at Pakistan's premier independent political uh, news monthly, uh, The Herald, and uh, during 2006-2007, he was also a visiting scholar from Oxford, University of Oxford, and has a BA from uh, the London School of Economics and a master's degree from St. Anthony's College in, Ax in Oxford, and uh, we welcome you, and we'll, uh, you have five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, <coughs> for allowing me this opportunity. Um, I've listened with care to what my colleagues, uh, uh, the fellow witnesses, have had to say. Uh, I would like to clarify at the outset that my testimony is based on my experiences as someone who has researched extensively on human rights abuses in Balochistan, often on the ground in uh, uh, the province itself. Uh, now. At the outset, because there has been this question of uh, independence that has been raised, I want to clarify that Human Rights Watch, as an international human rights organization, takes no position on this particular issue of independence. Uh, we understand that Balochistan is an internationally recognized part of Pakistan, and we expect the Pakistani government to adhere to all human rights protections uh, within pa the Pakistani constitution and as mandated by international law. Um, we have also found the Pakistani state, particularly the, the military, uh, entirely lacking in this uh, uh, department. Um, Balochistan presents a hydra-headed conflict situation. There are multiple actors perpetrating violence in there, but the engine of human rights abuse, no doubt, is the Pakistani military, paramilitaries, and intelligence agencies. They have run, particularly since 2004, a campaign of uh, enforced disappearances, where at least hundreds of, of Baloch nationalists have disappeared. 
Uh, in the last year and a half, we have seen targeted killings increase and uh, something between uh, 200 and 300 uh, 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 Baloch opponents of the Pakistani state have been uh, found killed. And, of course, torture and illegal detention by the military and paramilitaries and intelligence agencies are commonplace. Uh, this is a uh, absolutely appalling uh, situation, even by Pakistani standards. And certainly, when you uh, uh, are operating in Balochistan, you do see that the military, in many ways, behaves like a uh, brutal occupying military. That is its behavior. Um, all of this is a very serious problem. I would, however, point out that in the latest spike, uh, the issue of disappearances became commonplace in Pakistan and in Balochistan in particular because of uh, the license provided by the US, the UK, and other powers in the context of the war on terror where the, the, dis the disappearance <coughs> and legal detention of Taliban and Al-Qaeda suspects was green-lighted effectively by the US. This gave the Pakistani military uh, carte blanche, if you will, to extend such abusive operations to its own political opponents, which uh, include uh, Baloch uh, nationalists. Uh, having said that, there are also multiple abuses, though, of course, I must clarify that there is no comparison between the abuses perpetrated by the state and other actors, but there are abuses that we have documented by Baloch nationalist militants, particularly attacks against education personnel and against other non-Baloch uh, uh, residents of the province. Now, non-Baloch residents of the province are uh, not a small minority. We are talking of, uh, though there is contentious figures because of a lack of census, something about 40% at least of the population of Balochistan. Did you say 40 or 14? 4-0. Four 4-0. Zero. Four zero. Four zero. Percent of the population of Balochistan, this is an approximation, uh, are non-Baloch, uh, at least. Uh, so this is a very, very complex situation. Now, non-Baloch, particularly Punjabi settlers and Urdu-speaking settlers in Balochistan, are living equally in fear of their lives because of fear of attack from Baloch nationalists. Finally, there is the issue of ex religious militant groups, uh, particularly Sunni militant groups, that are attacking the Shia, uh, largely Hazara, but Shia in general. Uh, and, and these militant groups often do act, it is alleged uh, and widely believed, at, in conjunction with or at the behest of the Pakistani military. Uh, but they also act independently. The basic problem is that if the Pakistani state takes Balochistan seriously, it must enforce a rights-respecting rule of law in the province. It has abjectly failed to do, the, do so, and this is creating a human rights crisis across uh, Balochistan. <coughs> History. I like to read history. That's uh, and uh, uh, Mr. Peters uh, was expressing as uh, talking about Thomas Jefferson and such. I, I agree with you, Dr. Peters. That I think, or Mr. Peters, I should say, or Colonel Peters. Uh, I think that our uh, founding fathers and uh, uh, most of the people who built this country would be uh, turning over in their grave if they found out that we were sending American military personnel in order to maintain the colonial boundaries that were established by the people we had to fight in order to become independent. And uh, many of the conflicts that uh, we have throughout the world today, I agree with you, uh, Colonel Peters, that uh, can be traced right back uh, to the colonial era with decisions that were made by colonial powers. And then uh, we end up uh, in conflicts like this uh, and especially if the United States intervenes in order to maintain a status quo of border lines, which is what we seem to be doing, uh, this is not uh, uh, consistent with our national interests or our traditions uh, uh, at all. And I think America needs to re-examine 
this issue and have a, a heartfelt uh, debate internally about what should motivate America to get involved. But one thing is for sure, when someone is helping kill Americans or threatening to, uh, 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 to set up some sort of dictatorship uh, over uh, uh, for whatever cause, uh, Americans, sh uh, <laughs> we should not be on their side in helping them. And uh, I think that what broke the, the straw that broke the camel's back uh, was when we found out that not only has Pakistan been arming uh, the, uh, those uh, Taliban and, and other radicals that have been murdering American soldiers in Afghanistan, but they have given uh, uh, aid and comfort and, and safe haven to the man who masterminded the slaughter of 3,000 Americans. And uh, anybody who doesn't believe that they did that uh, is uh, uh, an irrational optimist about what's going on down there. I think that uh, uh, at that point we need to understand that we cannot back up everything that Pakistan does simply because something might disturb the lines that were drawn so long ago and that would create instability. Uh, with that said, I so uh, thank you. Would you like to comment on that? And uh, yeah, if I if I may. Um, Mr. Chairman. But you only got about 20 seconds okay. to do Mr. it. Mr. Chairman, um, you'd like to read history. Today you are making history. Um, not only does Pakistan facilitate terrorism in Afghanistan while playing triple and quadruple games, but we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that Pakistan has made us complicit in terrorism against India. Because Pakistan, using the nuclear red herring, knows that they have been able to sponsor attacks against New Delhi, against Mumbai, and knowing we will step in and stop India from retaliating. Imagine how different it would be if the Pakistanis didn't think they could count on us to run interference. Okay. I think that's a good point. Let me just end my questions and answers with this, this thought. Uh, and it's been expressed by our witnesses. If we're going to be taken seriously when we talk like this, we have to be consistent and we have to be honest. And uh, I certainly, whether it's the Singh province or, or Baluchistan or what's going on in the Baluch province in Iran or what's going on in, in, in the Baluch province in Pakistan, we, if people, those people have a right to the self-determination, which is what is being testified today. Uh, let's note, I think that people of Kashmir also uh, have a right to their self-determination. And uh, I think uh, Dr. Fair might want to comment on that. I mean, I'm, I'm going to focus my comments upon our relationship with Pakistan. 30 seconds, and then we <laughs> 30 have to seconds. But I, I do want to say one thing, the Leahy Amendment. For the last several years, I've been looking at our relationship with Pakistan, and we have been very negligent in taking the Leahy Amendment seriously. Whether we're looking at Pakistan abuses in FATA or SWAT, um, talking to U.S. officials, we don't even populate the Leahy database, or we, we've, be begun, we've begun doing so quite late in the game. But the problem goes back to what Ali Dion was saying, is that in many ways, Pakistan's abuse of human rights served our interests. And so we're kind of coming to this late in the game that we're trying to ask the Pakistanis to clean up their act after we've given them a blank check for about a decade, literally a blank check for about that's, a decade. Uh, we, that's correct. I think we've been manipulated for a long, <laughs> longer than that. We have about eight minutes before we have to be on the floor for a vote. Uh, could you, uh, uh, would you like to... So you ask a couple of questions. I have a question. And we'll give each one of our Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll minutes. do this very quickly to try to get some other uh, people in as well. Uh, I wanted to go to uh, Dr. Bohr. Um, in 2008, in written testimony before Congress, he wrote about the political, cultural, and economic oppression of the Baluch people uh, at the hands of the Iranian regime. I'm interested in hearing what, if anything, has changed uh, in the past four years. Uh, and secondly, it, with regard to the uh, Baluchistan areas in Iran, uh, how do you see their sentiment in terms of uh, being open to uh, working with the West? I think uh, Baluch in general, whether in Iran or in Pakistan, uh, they are very open. Huh? They have uh, uh, welcome U.S. support with arm, uh, with open arm, and they have also. Uh, expressed their uh, desire that uh, if Baluchistan become independent to provide huh, the U.S. with uh, bases in Gwadar 
And of course, as you know, Baluchistan strategically probably is the most important piece of the land on the world, huh? stretching from the Strait of Hormuz to Karachi. Huh? And that is where the 40% of the world oil passes. And uh, unfortunately, the Chinese are building a, a naval base uh, or they are building water. And even more dangerous for the US strategic interest is uh, connecting the overland Karakam Highway to Gwadar, huh? so that uh, instead of going through US Navy in Pacific and uh, in Indian Ocean through the Indian Navy, huh? so they can come directly there, and that is the choke, uh, the Strait of Hormuz. So, uh, uh, so the Baluch uh, have historically, uh, in fact, uh, they have been searching. And of course, right now, there is a perfect coincidence of interest uh, between Baluch and the US, because Baluch, they don't want the oil pipeline to go from Iran to Pakistan, huh? in violation of US sanction. Uh, the Baluch, of course, uh, uh, they are secular. They are against the U uh, Pakistan sub uh, Taliban alliance because they are secular, and uh, they are want uh, to fight Taliban. If the US support the Baluch, they can stop Taliban uh, sheltered by ISI and Pakistani government in, Pak in Baluchistan. Yes, sir. We have time, uh, and, and I apologize to the enabling those who are going to be called. We have about three more minutes worth of questions and answers, and I'm going to grant uh, Louis Gomer uh, a minute, 15, for some very important papers. Uh, oh, right, right. Ooh, Judge has one more question. Yeah, Judge Poe, uh, uh, the minute, and then Louis Gomer. Uh, thank you for being here. I want to say this. I'm a, I'm a great believer in uh, self-determination for people who believe in it as well. Baluchistan, uh, I think, fits that category. Somebody over there in Baluchistan has been reading the Declaration of Independence that gives a justification on a moral and legal reason why uh, people can separate themselves from abusive governments. Uh, so uh, we will see how that plays out. Uh, as far as Pakistan goes, they are the Benedict Arnold in the relationship with the United States. Ten years and $20 billion later, we're still paying them uh, to uh, uh, not look out after our interests. Uh, they uh, persecuted the informant uh, that had gave us the information about Osama bin Laden, charged him with treason. I mean, how long is it going to take before we get the point? We don't need to continue to give American money to Pakistan at all. Uh, not a dime. <laughs> and uh, uh, they've proven they don't deserve it, and it's not in our national interest. And the third comment is, the United States, uh, as one of y'all has said, uh, needs to look to India as a supporter and as an ally uh, on the, uh, not just the economic front, but the uh, war on terror as well. And lastly, uh, Mr. Peters, you will never make it as a diplomat in the State Department. Congressman, I am proud. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> You see, it's always great to have Texans around, you know, they, <laughs> they just step right up. And here's another one, Louis Gomer. Gomer. Well, and thank you, and I, I couldn't agree with my fellow former judge from Texas more, but uh, it is greatly disturbing to hear that weapons that we have provided to Pakistan have been utilized to create human rights violations. That is particularly disturbing. That's not what this nation is about. Uh, and it would seem to me that since we are trying to get out of Afghanistan and turn that country over to them, the quicker we could stop assisting Pakistan in funding the Taliban that we are trying to fight, which is also creating human rights violations against Baluchistan, it sounds like we could create a real win for the United States, <coughs> Baluchistan, Baluchs, for people of Afghanistan, if we just quit helping Pakistan help all of our enemies. So I appreciate your testimony. If I, I look forward to anything additionally they may have to submit. We've got three minutes uh, before we have to be on the floor to vote, so I will give a 30 second summary. Uh, first of all, thank you. Uh, there was a lot of trepidation by people uh, before we hold, held this hearing. Uh, I got so many emails that uh, uh, threatening all sorts of crazy things and worrying that some people would be represented. Uh, uh, we learned a lot by this hearing. We put a lot of stuff on the record. This is uh, not to plot out some sort of conspiracy. What we're here to discuss is uh, start a national dialogue in the open 
about what America's policy should be in this very volatile part of the world and where our ideals for uh, human dignity and, and freedom and justice and self-determination, where they fit in to our policies in that part of the world. So we've started the discussion today. I think this hearing was a, was a first good step. And uh, it was certainly not a stunt on anybody's part. We honestly really were going to try to get into these issues. So I want to thank you all for, for coming. And I'm sorry we do have to run off for our votes right now. This hearing is adjourned. Thank you.